time full time uh, at a startup called Logic Blocks, which I'm going to tell you about today. Okay. Um, so um, the, the talk is sort of going to be in three parts. Uh, I'm probably going to have to uh, fly in spots since we only have 45 minutes, uh, but, but I'll, I'll, I'll try and cover the, the parts that I think will be most interesting to you. Um, so the, the three parts of the talk roughly are going to present sort of the vision, what, what are we doing, what's motivating us. I'll talk a little bit about the language that we've developed uh, to carry out that vision and, and also the implementation of the runtime system. Okay. So what are we doing at Logic Blocks? We're working in the space of enterprise software. Okay. Uh, this is um, uh, 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 one, one definition that I like is, is due to our CEO uh, who, who refers to it as software someone pays you to use. Okay. In other words, software that you know typically you you would never use if you didn't have to because it's, it tends to be really painfully bad. Um, so uh, this this is software that. Uh, performs all sorts of functions uh, in, in, in businesses or, or governments or education or whatever for doing things like accounting, sales, supply chain, customer relationship management, and so on. Okay, it's a very very big market. Okay, uh, last estimates uh, I got last year was was that so it was approaching three hundred billion dollars uh, a year, um, and the state of affairs in enterprise software is kind of shockingly bad. Uh, it, 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 it sort of uh, amazed me, at least, uh, when, I, when I started working with Logic Blocks, uh, looking at sort of what the state of the art in this space was. Uh, there's really, really a lot of room for improvement. Okay? And in fact, a lot of people, if they're using one of these applications, um, will typically find some way to bypass it. Okay? Uh, you know, most enterprise decisions still made with Excel. Um, um, and you know, uh, my, my own uh, experience along these lines is, you know, at, at UC Davis we have uh, grading uh, software, uh, and it's so bad to use that I would just do it in Excel and then paste paste the results afterwards, yeah? and that's that's sort of typical. Okay, so why is it such? Uh, why why is the state of affairs so bad? So it's 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 a story about sort of. Uh, um, crazy complexity emerging um, um, as a result of uh, the different tasks that have to be done and coordinated. Okay, so in this diagram we've got three uh, columns: uh, bookkeeping, BI, and planning. So, so what are these? Uh, so bookkeeping is like um, keeping track of, of things that are happening at the present. You know, so you, you buy an airplane ticket and that's got to be uh, logged in a transaction database, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so that's that's recording what's happening now. And then BI, which stands for business intelligence, um, is uh, looking at large collections of past bookkeeping data, okay, and trying to do something useful with them. For example, if you're a, uh, a big retail chain, you might be looking at your historical data in order to try and uh, forecast demand for a certain product, okay? So, uh, so that's BI, uh, and then planning um, involves looking into the future, okay? So. Um, you know, and, and all these things are very much intertwined. So you, you, you might uh, be, be looking at your historical uh, sales data, let's say, and then you want to uh, make some plans uh, for what you're going to do in the future. Okay. All right, and then uh, applications here uh, also um, come come along the sort of uh, three three rows that you see in here. So you have a data layer on the bottom, an application layer in the middle, and then a view layer on top. Okay. All right, and for each of the, the squares in this matrix, you, you have a different sort of uh, paradigm or system. So for example, uh, for the data layer of bookkeeping, you would have a transactional or OLTP database, okay, specialized for that sort of task. Um, and uh, for that paradigm, you have many choices, such as Oracle, MySQL, SQL Server, et cetera. Okay? Uh, and typically, at a big company, you won't just have one of these choices, but you'll have like all of them. Okay? <laughs> Because you have different departments doing their own bookkeeping, or companies that uh, grew out of uh, a series of acquisitions, and so on. So typically, you see not just one thing in there, but, but many. Okay. On top of that, you've got an application server. So the, the database is done down here. Just holds data to build applications. You need a, a special uh, another platform called an application server. Okay. Again, many choices here: Oracle, WebLogic, SAPS, ABAP, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then on top, you build a user interface, and typically nowadays that's done uh, via some web-based technology uh, like HTML5 or JavaScript, Flash. Okay. All right. So so far, that's just for the bookkeeping column, uh, and then also naturally you have to uh, 
uh, connect these layers somehow. So for example, to connect the da data and application layer, you're using typically uh, maybe some object relational mapping technology like Hibernate or Simple Alchemy, okay, and so on. All right, uh, and then when we go to BI, we again have the same stack all over, all over again, uh, except uh, everything is specialized now to, to the BI scenario. So you have a different flavor of database system, an analytical database or OLAP database. Uh, again, many choices there. Uh, Teradata, uh, Vertica is a more recent entrant. Um, you have a, a special flavor app, application server. Again, you're building user interfaces. Okay, and then uh, for planning, typically the application and data layers are merged a little bit, uh, but again, you have uh, specialized systems handling this. Uh, the view layer, uh, you often have Excel. Um, uh, and then finally, uh, to connect all of these three columns, you're going to have uh, so-called ETL, uh, ETL tools. Uh, and, and there again, you have uh, many choices, okay? So many flavors of ETL, a uh, few standards, okay? So we have this, this whole sort of uh, zoo of systems here. Uh, each of them is coming with their own uh, language. Um, um, you know, you're, you're using SQL typically down here. Uh, maybe Java up here, something else up here, and so on. Okay, so so to orchestrate um, uh, uh, an application that works, uh, you know, uh, involves all three uh, layers, uh, you you have to somehow connect um, all these pieces of technology together. Okay, and this this picture that I've drawn here, uh, which looks chaotic already, is actually sort of a cartoony simplification of what you see uh, in the wild. So, for example. Uh, here's here's a, a two percent, okay, <laughs> a screenshot from, from from one of our customers, okay, of, of their supply chain uh, IT configuration, okay. So if you look at inside all these boxes, it's a little hard to see, but if you're going to see, you know, uh, instantiations of the, of the different pieces uh, that I showed uh, just now, okay. So this is a total nightmare, okay. Um, it's sort of. Uh, working with, with a system like this is just uh, kind of soul-crushing work. <laughs> uh, as you might imagine, if you want to change uh, you know, some little piece down here, uh, and the changes might ripple through the whole picture, it's going to involve getting you know, uh, a room full of experts from different parts of the company together. Uh, and it just, it just doesn't work. Okay? All right, so, uh, so all, all of this, you know, uh, it might be said to sort of make you tremble with indignity if you have to have to work on a system like this. Um, so it might put us in a sort of revolutionary mindset, you know, if you tremble with indignity at every injustice, then you are a comrade of logic blocks. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. So what we're trying to do is 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 start over. Okay. Uh, so we're saying forget this hairball that I just showed you on, on the previous slides. The hairball is done. Okay. Uh, nobody in their right mind would design things uh, sort of from scratch to work that way. So instead, we're trying to minimize the moving parts, minimize the glue okay, that's involved in, in building enterprise applications. And how are we going to do that? We're trying to unify the programming model, unify the execution environments, and in general, just simplify ruthlessly everywhere we can. Okay? All right. And uh, the foundation of all this, uh, at least from a, from a language's point of view, uh, is a language we've developed called Logical, which is a declarative uh, programming language based on Datalog. Uh, so Datalog, uh, I have no idea if it's uh, taught these days in the database systems class here yet. So it, so it was, uh, it's been, been studied uh, for a long time, uh, so since the, the early 80s, okay? Um, but it was, it was, it never caught on in a commercial context uh, for, for a number of reasons. Um, but uh, we've embraced Datalog uh, as, as a foundation for what we're trying to do. Okay? We think it's a very good match for a lot of reasons. Okay, so our language is based on Datalog in a similar way. If you've taken a programming languages class that, that you know, say Haskell or some other functional programming language is based on the Lambda calculus. Okay, this sort of clean, clean formal, uh, formalism underneath. All right, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to take all this, all these layers and collapse, collapse them into you know, one language in runtime, okay? And, and uh, typically on top of this, we're still building you know, our web applications uh, in, in HTML5 or JavaScript, but even that we're trying to do uh, as much as we can in Datalog or in Logical, okay? All right, and an analogy for the rest of us, um, uh, here on the left we have uh, a photo from the 80s that, that went virally a year or so ago, okay? 
uh, you know, showing the, the constellation of all the, 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 the cutting edge technology from uh, um, Consumer Electronics Show, uh, I forget what year this was. Um, and, and this is more or less the situation today in, in enterprise uh, software. Okay, so you've got all these specialized components that are pretty good at doing you know, the thing that they're good at, uh, but, but you, know, uh, you, you need a pretty big backpack or a van to carry them around. Okay, and what we're trying to do is, is we're, we're sort of trying to build the iPhone, as it were, uh, of databases. Okay? So, you know, uh, the iPhone doesn't have as good a camera as, say, a you know, professional uh, um, SLR camera. It doesn't have as good, uh, um, you know, an email uh, program as, you know, something you could use on your laptop, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it's all there in one package that's so easy to use and sort of clean that, that it just absolutely dominates it uh, and, and, and disrupts it, you know, all these other specialized technologies. Okay? So if you're a wedding photographer or something like that, you know, uh, fine. We're not trying to to sell you the the, the world's greatest you know professional camera, um, but the, the market, the consumer market for cameras is is much much bigger than the professional market. Okay, so that's what that's what we're going after, sort of consumerization of stuff. Okay, so that all sounds kind of ambitious. So at this point, you might be asking, are you crazy, naive, delusional, or what? Um, what makes you think you could possibly pull this off? Um, and, uh, well, uh, we are pulling this off, okay? Um, unfortunately, since this talk is being videotaped, I, I had to censor <laughs> at the last minute uh, uh, the, the icons of uh, some of our clients because we have NDAs and so on. But if, uh, if I would lift this box off, you would see uh, a screen full of logos <coughs> of, uh, of, of companies, uh, big companies you know, okay? So um, if you've gone shopping recently somewhere around here in town, chances are you've actually used their stuff, okay? All right, so, uh, and, and, and sort of our, our, um, our, our philosophy here is, is that, you know, sometimes the more ambitious plan may have better chances of success, right? So, you know, this is, this is sort of uh, one of the oldest tricks in, in, in the book in, in mathematics. If you're trying to prove something and you're having trouble, try proving something stronger, okay? <laughs> Which sometimes paradoxically can, can, can make the problem easier. All right, so that's the vision. Now that we're all uh, motivated and revolutionary minded, uh, let's look a little bit uh, at, at the language that we're working with, uh, and then I'll talk a bit also about the runtime, okay, the, the, the implementation. All right, so, uh, so the language, as I said, is based on the data log, this, this kind of funky old language from, from the database academic literature. So why did we choose data log? Uh, this is, this is a, a, a a uh, question a lot of people uh, will ask us. Um, so I'll, I'll show you examples in a second that will that will give you a flavor of the language. Uh, but basically, it has a lot of a lot of things uh, in its favor. So um, so it's it's a really a declarative language. Okay, well, more declarative you could argue than, than SQL, for example. Okay, so it's it's not at all like programming, you know, writing a Java program or a C program or uh, or even a Haskell program. You're not telling the the, the, the system how to carry out the computation. You're, you're saying what you want computed, okay, in a certain way. And then the system will go off and, and, and do it for you, okay. Um, and the language is also simple enough that, that we can sort of, uh, it, it works well as, as with, with what, what we like to call language skin. So, so you know, if we're building an application where uh, someone wants something that, that um, looks and feels like a spreadsheet, we can sort of put a thin veneer on the language and it will just suddenly feel like you're, you're writing Excel macros, okay? All right, so another selling point, expressivity. Um, so this is actually a really uh, fascinating subject if you, if you, if you like uh, theoretical computer science especially. So uh, data log is a very un well understood um, expressive power, ex expressivity with a sort of controllable power. So, you can kind of know just by what features of the language you're, you're adding or allowing to be used, you know exactly what the, the complexity from a theoretical point of view is of evaluating. So for example, uh, data log with negation, um, it captures polynomial time. So raise your hand if you've heard polynomial time uh, in one of your classes so far. Okay, maybe now heard this class or something. Okay, so the amazing thing about data log, every, every data log program can be evaluated in polynomial time. And every polynomial time algorithm can be expressed uh, as a data log program, data log application. Okay, so that's, that's kind of mind blowing, at least to me. 
Um, so and even more mind blowing is that you know this company has a CEO who likes this kind of stuff too. <laughs> Um, okay, safety. So, so you know, by default, we don't give you Turing completeness. Um, that, that's important when you're when you're working in a sort of server environment. You don't want a computations to go flying off the rails and diverge. Um, and we also know how to give you transactional semantics. Okay, so th these are terms you might know from a database sy systems class. Uh, Acid uh, transactions uh, with full serializability. So, uh, so that's that's actually. Um, uh, uh, a big selling point uh, for our system. Most systems don't go for this full serializability because they consider it too hard. Okay, um, performance. We know how to get good performance. Uh, we have decades of, of research uh, and development in database systems to, to draw upon. We're, we're doing you know automatic optimization, incremental evaluation, parallelization, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, stuff that's really really hard to do with uh, you know uh, a, 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 a more conventional programming language. Let's say. Okay. Uh, language is also quite sort of concise and elegant. Um, you know, compared to SQL, it's it's like an order of magnitude um, easier to parse and, and generally deal with inside the runtime. And there's a very large uh, body of mostly <coughs> uncommercialized research, okay, uh, to draw on. So so these are all the selling points. So let me let me give you a little uh, flavor of the language, okay. Um, so some of these slides, by the way, I have to apologize, they were they were for a slightly different. Audience actually gave a uh, talk about the system um, uh, last fall, I guess it was almost a year ago now, uh, to uh, an academic audience at a, a data log uh, workshop. Okay, so that, that was sort of, um, you know, I got to use nerdy terms like stratify data log with negation up there, and they knew exactly what I meant. Um, so, in any case, uh, what, what it looks like is you have uh, tables, um, sort of, uh, or we call them predicates, you have facts in those tables. Okay, and that's that's your data model. Okay, uh, and it's types, of course. So so uh, you know here in the first line, I'm declaring the unary predicate A that's going to hold strings. Uh, in the second line, I'm declaring a binary predicate B that's going to hold pairs of strings. Uh, I can declare facts like this and say apple is a fact in A, apple banana is a fact in B, and so on. Okay. Um, and uh, of course, we support the, the the usual types you would expect from a type programming language. Um, and, uh, and then, um, what you can do in data log is you can write uh, derived tables, okay? So, I might want to define a new table C that's going to depend on those other tables, okay? So, here I'm, I'm defining a table C, I'm saying everything in A is also going to be in C, okay? And then, in this one, <laughs> everything in B that joins with something in C, okay? Uh, and so, I'm using negation here also. Uh, then that's going to go to C also. Okay, so uh, so if you know SQL, um, uh, uh, you can this this is sort of uh, there's there's a uh, translation you can read this also as as uh, these are like SQL queries. Okay, so these are sort of like almost, every rule here is almost like a little select from where block. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, but one of the, the, the rather crucial things about data log is that you can also define things recursively. So, so here I've defined C in terms of itself. Okay, so it's a recursive definition. Okay, uh, and that, that, that gives you, uh, that, that's the key to its expressive power. All right, um, so uh, what else can I do in this language? I can write uh, integrity constraints. That's, that's quite important. Okay. So this is this is almost like the analog of um, uh, assertions. Okay, that that uh, you would write in a in a conventional programming language. Okay, so I might have a table like this, foo, and it's holding pairs of ints and, and date times, and I might write a, a constraint that says the following: if I have something x y in foo, and I also have something x z in foo, okay, so with the same x. Then it must follow that y equals c. Okay. So anybody uh, who's taken a databases class uh, recognize this style of constraint? What is it called in databases? Going once, going twice. Okay. This is called a functional dependency. Okay. Because uh, because I'm declaring that that basically foo is a function. It's taking whatever x you give it. It's going to return you exactly one y. Okay. Right? So associated with each x value, uh, you're going to have exactly one, one other value. Okay? 
And we use these functional uh, predicates so often that we actually have a uh, special syntactic sugar for it. So this is just how we have to write it, the uh, square brackets. Okay. Okay. Um, let's see. Facts and updates. Um, so, uh, so of course, uh, databases are not static beasts. Uh, you have to deal with updates. You have to, to add new data, retract data, change them over time. Okay, so the language lets you talk about that also. Okay, this is a uh, plus here is an insertion, so I'm saying insert into C this back to the world, and the minus is a subtraction. <laughs> I'm saying um, um, whatever, what, uh, I'm saying that's, you know, remove this tuple from D. Okay. All right, so that all so far um, is uh, fairly uh, conventional, okay? So, uh, with respect to sort of the existing work on data logs. So, one of the places where we've uh, done some stuff that's, uh, that's a little bit different um, has to do with facilities for talking about uh, temporal aspects uh, and, and also um, updates, uh, sort of responding to updates, sort of what we call delta logic. Okay? And this is um, actually inspired by, by uh, uh, some work uh, from the database theory community, okay? So, which, which we uh, we, we thought it was sort of a nice way to think about what we wanted to build. Okay, so um, for example, I might want to say increments g at x, the value of g at x, whenever some event occurs. Okay, I'll give you some concrete examples of these events uh, in a minute. All right, but the basic idea is that, you know, if g at 1 was 2, and now this event comes in, okay, then I'm going to, after this, um, I want g at 1 to be 3. Okay, so in order to express this sort of logic, we let you talk about the state of things just before the currently executing transaction. Okay, so at prep means before the transaction, and then plus event, that's saying before the transaction there was no event, and now there is, okay, at x, so that's responding to an update. Okay, so this is combining updates and, and, and temporal uh, reasoning in a limited fashion. And this funny little character here is, is our uh, so what we call an upsert. It basically means clobber whatever value was at x uh, with y plus one. Okay. Um, and there's uh, finally uh, we have something in the language called entity types. Uh, this uh, this is interesting again for for the, the sort of uh, academic databases audience, uh, especially because uh, it connects with uh, work that's been done uh, recently on, on data exchange and data integration. Um, but it also it's a mechanism for you know, inventing new values, and you can also use them to build data structures and so on. Uh, but I'll kind of skip through this. Um, all right, uh, so that I can get to uh, a little uh, a toy uh, application example so that you can kind of get the flavor of how all this works, okay? All right, so um, in this application, we're going to have a data tier, an application tier, a UI tier, just like I showed in that diagram uh, in the beginning, okay? My data tier, let's say I'm storing sales data, the application tier, uh, maybe I'll be uh, writing some rules having to do with data access permissions, and then the UI tier, I'm going to you know, build a little web page that's going to um, uh, compute data, display it, and, and respond to user interface events like button clicks and so on. Okay? And, and I'm going to do all this in the same language. Okay? Um, so, for example, you know, uh, I might have uh, sales, so for, for, this is very typical actually of, uh, you know, the, the way uh, the data looks in real applications that we build. So you might have, for each product, for each day, and for each store, I'm going to have the total sales. Okay? Um, and, uh, and then I'm also going to, you know, keep track of which products are sold in which stores, so I have a relation uh, that relates to products and stores. Okay, I might keep track also of who manages which store. Okay, so here's uh, a binary predicate here, manager, so it just associates stores with their managers. Okay, now I might want in my application logic uh, tier uh, to uh, express some things having to do with, for example, access permissions. Okay, so I might want to say that managers can only modify products sold in their stores. Okay. Uh, so again, what I can do is I can write this as a little data log rule. So it says that if some product is sold in the store and the manager of the store is the manager, then that product is modifiable. <coughs> okay. 
So you can see it's kind of nifty to be able to write these little uh, views, and then you, your, your application is, is going to use this modifiable by uh, information. Okay. Uh, and then finally, we, we might want to buy, uh, build a, a little uh, sales uh, data entry form on a web page. Uh, it looks something like this. You know, so the title of it is going to be sales data entry. So I'm uh, going to declare myself a form. And again, this all just looks like database data, okay? Regular facts in the database. Um, but, but they're going to be uh, displayed as, you know, uh, a user interface, okay? It's just a, uh, just a way of rendering the data, let's say. Okay, so I'm going to declare that the title of the form should be sales data entry, so that's going to um, you know, uh, display that title of the form. Okay, uh, I want to have a, item, a drop down box for, for items, uh, so I'm going to declare it that way again, just as, as sort of um, you know, a rule that says if I have a sales entry form, then I should have this item drop down list on it. Okay, um, and then I might want a submit button on there also, so again, if I have a sales entry form, then I should have uh, a submit button. Okay, so it's a, it's a very sort of declarative rule-based way of uh, building UI. Okay, um, so this is just a toy example, but this is you know this is how we, we build real uh, sort of industrial strength applications too. Okay, um, good. Uh, okay, and then uh, here's an example of where I'm using some of that application. Uh, tier uh, logic, in particular, you know, this, this rule about who can modify what. So in the drop-down values for this item component, okay, um, I'm going to write a little rule which is going to populate um, this uh, list of items with only, only the items that are modifiable by the current user of the application. Okay, so I'm using that modifiable by rule uh, that I wrote before, okay, and basically I'm saying if I have some component on the form that's items and uh, the sales entry form user for this form is user and the item is modified by the user, then the drop down values should contain item. Okay. So this will accomplish populating the list um, um, with, with all the items that they can modify. Okay. But um, I'm doing this in a sort of declarative way, so I, I don't actually, I'm not writing a piece of code that's saying, populate the list, right, like you would in, in writing Java or something, you'd like fill in some data structure. I'm just writing some rules that say, hey, if you've got this component, then this sales entry form I'm on file, then this thing better hold also. Okay? And the system will go figure out how to, how to make that happen. All right, so it's, it's, uh, it's kind of a fun, very different way of, of writing programs. Okay? Um, good. Uh, and then finally, uh, we saw an example of, of that uh, of you know responding to an event and incrementing a counter uh, a few slides back. Here's a, here's a sort of concrete example of where we want to do this kind of thing. So what happens when the user clicks the submit button? Okay, the way we model that is as an update to data because everything is data in the database uh, in this way of thinking. Okay, uh, so the way we respond to a button click is uh, using this um, event logic here that says. If I had an insertion in button click on this form, it's mix, and all this other stuff uh, that, that, that you know ultimately calculates the value for a product in store, then I'm going to set this uh, sales entry um, you know to the result of that calculation. Okay, so that's that's going to going to give you the ability to respond to external stimuli. Let's see. Okay. All right. Uh, good. Um, okay, this is all a bunch more sort of inside baseball for the database theory nerds that I'm gonna I'm gonna skip here, but um, um, uh, it's, it's fun for database theory nerds like me. Um, and then we have a bunch of other uh, features in, in the language: uh, higher order predicates, module system libraries, safety analyses, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. <coughs> okay. Um, all right. Um, all right, so that's the language. Uh, so that, 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 that sort of whirlwind introduction, uh, but, but hopefully you get the flavor of it at least. Um, so in the last bit of the talk, um, I just want to talk uh, a little bit about sort of the, the implementation of all this stuff. Okay. All right. So how the heck do we build this? Okay. So what is the logic blocks runtime? Okay. So the runtime is, is actually sort of the, the implementation of, of, of the system that's able to carry out all these computations. Okay, so it's an industrial strength DBMS supporting uh, logical language. 
okay, supporting efficient incremental maintenance. Okay, so what is incremental maintenance? Well, all those rules are really sort of defining tables in terms of other tables, right? So when you have updates down here, you have to kind of update the thing that depends on it, and you have to be able to do that very efficiently. Okay, so that's, that's a big area of emphasis for us. Uh, asset semantics with full serializability, um, that's, that's you know, uh, for, for, for uh, people who are working with databases, that's a big deal. Uh, failure recovery, et cetera. All right, uh, so where we are at present in, in sort of the company's development is that uh, up until version 3x, okay, uh, uh, which we, we call inside the company the old runtime, okay, we had a very conventional DBMS architecture. Uh, Lock-based concurrency, semi-naive evaluation, uh, dread for maintenance, these are just sort of data, textbook uh, data log techniques. And, and this thing's been, been paying the bills, okay, so this is what's deployed right now <coughs> with uh, the, the, the customers whose logos you, you sadly couldn't see uh, earlier on in the talk, okay? Um, but over time, and because of uh, the particular requirements of what we're trying to do, this sort of all-in-one package, um, the, the limitations of the conventional DBMS architecture sort of became more and more apparent, okay? And we, uh, this inspired us a, a few years ago to start on a, essentially a complete rethinking of the system architecture from scratch. Um, which, which we're, um, which we're uh, essentially finishing right now. It uh, should be entering production around the end of the year. Um, and this is really fun stuff uh, for, for you know, uh, someone who's interested in databases and database architectures because uh, what we're doing here is really, really pretty different and, and radically different uh, in many ways. Okay. Uh, I should give a credit here. The, the, the architect of this effort uh, is uh, Another Todd, uh, another ex-professor named Todd, Todd Feldhusen, who in his case he came from Waterloo. Okay. Um, uh, so good. So so let me just sort of um, uh, try and explain a little bit um, uh, the, the, the challenges here, why we had to do something something fairly fairly radical to address them. So we want to build a smart database. We want to build the iPhone, not this thing. Okay. So there are influential voices in the community. Um, who actually claim this, this basically can't be done, okay? Uh, so, for example, here are a couple slides from a uh, talk uh, by Michael Stonebreaker, who's a, who's a very well-known um, uh, uh, database systems researcher. Uh, okay? And these are from a talk he's been giving lately called, called One Size Does Not Fit All, okay? So in this, uh, the DBMS landscape, I mentioned that, that you have uh, special, you know, uh, sort of in, in the, the conventional enterprise software stack, you have all these specialized components, okay? You have different flavors of databases for doing bookkeeping than you have for doing analytics, let's say, okay? So uh, he's rendering this as sort of a, a triangle, okay? So over here in the bottom right corner, you've got a transaction processing system, okay? And in the bottom left corner, what he calls data warehouse, that's also <coughs> Uh, uh, an OLAP system or an analytics system. Okay, so this is for dealing with the historical data, so we're dealing with the bookkeeping data, uh, and then for our other kinds of applications, uh, you, you again have a, sort of another corner of this triangle, okay? Um, and, and what he's arguing is that um, essentially um, the specialized systems at the, at the, at the corners, at the vertices of this triangle, uh, clobber, uh, that's the word he uses, um, the sort of uh, general general uh, one-size-fits-all approach, uh, which uh, sits in the middle here, and that's more or less what we're advocating, okay? All right, so clobber as in will outperform them by one or two, one or two orders of magnitude. two, okay? Um, so that's that's a big problem. Uh, for us, if, if, we're, if we're arguing, if this is really true, then we're sort of out of business, right? Because we're arguing this, this one-size-does-fit-most uh, 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 approach, okay? And, and, and even worse, uh, at least in his analysis, is that in this middle part of general systems, uh, more and more you have open source systems like MySQL or Postgres, okay, uh, which, which uh, are competing with uh, what he calls the elephants, okay, which is the sort of existing uh, commercial systems. Um, and, and so the elephants only kind of get, gets what, get, get the crumbs around the sides of this thing. All right, so, uh, so, so our claim is that 
Uh, this all is true only if you're considering conventional database system architectures that people have looked at so far. Okay? So our claim is that uh, this actually doesn't have to, this is, there's nothing fundamental that dictates uh, this will be the case. Okay? So, um, but uh, to establish that claim, you know, uh, you have to do some, some sort of science, right? <laughs> so, so a lot of what we've done um, in, in the implementation work has been some, um, some pretty serious, sophisticated uh, stuff uh, in order to make this all, all work well, okay? Um, so, you know, uh, uh, you know, lots of innovation in data structures and, and ways of thinking about the problem, okay, has gone into this, all right? So, just to give you a, a sort of a quick list of, of areas where we're innovating, okay? Uh, so, so uh, the join algorithm. So, if you know anything about database systems, you know that that is sort of one of the most basic and uh, important things it has to do is evaluate joins, okay? Um, SQL queries are, are largely about evaluating joins, okay? So, people have been studying join algorithms for decades, uh, so you might think that there's not much need to be done there. Uh, but in fact, we, uh, we have developed uh, a really nice new join algorithm um, that also has some very nice um, um, analytical results, things that you can say about it, okay? So that it doesn't just perform well on like a bunch of workloads that we've tested, but it actually is provably uh, sort of the best, the best you can actually do, okay? Worst case optimal in a certain precise sense. Um, so, uh, uh, this is uh, actually sort of a big deal because um, the first worst case optimal join algorithm uh, wasn't even known until uh, last year, okay? Um, uh, and then this, that was a paper that appeared in pods, the top database uh, theory conference, and won the best paper award, okay? Uh, but, but it turned out, when we looked at the, the algorithm that uh, Todd Veltensen had, had come up with, uh, turns out you can prove that one's worst case optimal too, okay? Um, uh, so that was that was uh, that was really fun. Okay. Um, cost estimation. So we're doing some some interesting stuff uh, in the area of cost estimation. Again, if, if you know database uh, systems, you know that this is this is a really big deal because what are they doing? They're having to figure out like how to uh, actually evaluate this declarative thing you specified, like a SQL query or a bunch of data log calls. Okay. In order to do that, they have to be able to compare alternatives. Um, and they have to be able to estimate the cost of those alternatives, figure out how long this will likely take to run versus that one, okay? So, uh, so um, uh, you know, if, if you want uh, good performance from your system, especially sort of reliable performance, like your review, um, then, then you need uh, to have really good cost estimation, okay? Now, this is a hard problem also, but we're doing some, some exciting new stuff in that space. Um, also, uh, paired along with the cost estimation, uh, the query optimizer, we're doing some, some exciting stuff there. Um, again, um, we sort of have a fetish for this, uh, you could say, but we, we sort of, we really like to be able to prove that things work well, not just like code it up and see if it like works okay, right? So for our query optimizer, we actually have some, some guarantees about how well it does. And that's very important because uh, it means that even for workloads that we haven't seen yet, we know it's going to do something pretty good, okay? All right, um, where else? Incremental maintenance. So, so again, uh, incremental maintenance algorithms, we put a, uh, a lot of attention uh, there. Uh, and again, we have uh, algorithms that are uh, um, optimal in some certain precise sense, okay? That says, you know, in some sense, you can't actually do any better than what we're doing. Uh, data structures, so we're, we've got some novel compression schemes, okay, so when you're dealing with very large uh, uh, sets of data, terabytes or, or, or petabytes, uh, you need compression, okay, uh, so that, so that it, you know, fits on less space on disk and then that, that way it takes less time to read it and so on. Um, uh, so we've got some nice compression uh, schemes. Uh, we're uh, making heavy use of uh, an idea from uh, programming languages that, that hasn't been applied uh, very much at all in database uh, systems, uh, namely the, 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 the so-called purely <coughs> functional or version or persistent data structures. Okay? Um, so uh, these things are actually incredibly powerful and we're using them sort of at all, all levels of our system architecture. So it's the key behind a number of our, 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 our uh, approaches. Okay, thread parallelism, so uh, 
uh, we, 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 we parallelize the execution um, automatically in a way that the user doesn't <coughs> say anything about that, you know, and that's, uh, you know, good luck doing that with the Java program, right? Uh, transactions, uh, the metadata system, uh, this is sort of internal engineering stuff, but this, this actually turns out to be incredibly important also, especially when you're a relatively small startup trying to get something of this magnitude done, uh, and in the language itself. Okay, so just to wrap up, um, we're using data log as the foundation of our approach to uh, dramatically simplify enterprise application development. Okay, um, it's an ambitious agenda for sure, uh, but we think we have a, a, a real shot at success and being very disruptive in this space. Um, um, okay, so we, we've, we've taken data log as sort of our starting point from language, but we've, uh, we've, we've freely extended it to make it uh, practical. Um, and you know, building an industrial strength system from the ground up twice now has, has allowed us to revisit basic architectural fundamentals um, and, and, uh, and do some really exciting and innovative stuff that, that, um, that, that we certainly hope to be sharing more of the details uh, with uh, as, as we publish them um, in, the, in the near future. So, all right, that's all. Thank you very much. several flavors of databases because none of them will handle these mixed workloads of transactions and analytics. Um, and that it just turns the, the software engineering effort into a nightmare. Um, and then, you know, uh, SQL is not very ambitious in, in, in what it's trying to let you express. So to build an application, you're typically going to have to mix and match SQL in some host language. And, and all of this is just, you know, if you've done it even on the scale of a student project, you'll, you'll see what a pain in the neck it is, right? So, uh, so for, in some sense, the, the biggest problem to me comes down to usability. Okay? But to solve that problem, you have to solve some really hard technical problems. Yeah. Anyone else? Other questions? Sound silence. <laughs> and maybe you could tell us yes or no. And everything that we want Oh, uh, right, so um, the short answer is no. Um, so SQL, uh, um, so, so the big thing that's different in data log is recursion. <laughs> SQL has a form of recursion also, but it's a more limited form called li linear recursion. Um, and, and you can prove that you can't express everything in linear recursion, you can in general recursion. So it's a sort of theoretical argument uh, that gives you a crisp answer, no. Um, but there are also sort of practical arguments about like what's reasonable to you know express in SQL versus in our language, um, and a lot of things that even in theory are expressible in SQL are really cumbersome to express. Yeah. So so it's not you know not, uh, you'd be crazy to try and you know use C in my opinion <laughs> SQL as a general purpose programming language even if, even if you could figure out how to. 